من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم viewers of Imam Hussain TV welcome to tonight's live program man often has been de described as the best of creation man often is also referred to as often having three embodiments incorporating his presence the physical body which is often referred to in Arabic as a jism the mental state his consciousness as his aql or nafs but also more deep we also have one term referred to as the soul or the ruh in tonight's program inshallah we'll be looking at the spiritual aspects how one can maintain spirituality how one can evolve spiritually and reach the heights and also some of the challenges faced by man and what he should use as methods often religions and beliefs that specifically the early monotheistic religions talk about methods in terms of how they specifically use to attain spiritual heights the early mayans the greeks the indian tribes the african tribes also in tonight's program specifically we'll be looking at the fiqh of islam the jafri fiqh the shia school of thought and with me tonight we have Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam, Hajj Muhammad. Congratulations. Shukran, shukran. Thank you. As, as you all know, uh, Hajj Muhammad's been on Hajj, so I think you're more entitled to speak about this topic than I am. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Thank you. It's been uh, certainly a blessing that I was invited to uh, the house of um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and visited also Medina and numerous places inshallah one one day i'll be able to uh, share with share with the audience the um, experiences that i've encountered some lovely people that i've met but uh, for tonight's topic inshallah we'll be looking at spirituality and just moving away from the abstract side as it were really trying to take this program so that it's personable as it were to the mm. audience in terms of how man can actually evolve so the first question i suppose what we can ask is the leg do you think there's too much emphasis or legal legalistic emphasis on the spiritual discussion or not enough in today's world how can one be really looking to attain those spiritual heights what should he or sh what should he or she do really it's the first question i do believe that um there is a major focus on law more than there is on spirituality Right. Even though when you're looking at the whole Islamic worldview, law is a tool for us to become more spiritual. In many of our mosques today, there is a major focus on legal discussion. Yeah. Much of our identity today as Muslims is very much related to legal ordinances, legal principles. Are we following that which is obligatory? Are we staying away from that which is for example, seen as reprehensible or that Absolutely. which is seen as prohibited. And therefore you find the major complaint in our mosques is that there isn't enough discussions on spirituality. They feel that when you go to listen to lectures, for example, in the mosques, or you listen to the uh, sermons on a Friday, there is a histor historical content, there's theological content, mm -hmm. but there doesn't seem to be what many define as spiritual content right now spiritual content many have defined in different ways and what many don't realize as well is that observing law and having legal discussion is part of one spiritual journey if you're looking at what we call um wajib and mustahab and mm -hmm. makruh and haram and mubah, mubah yeah. ahkam taklifiyya when you're looking at something which is obligatory or something which is recommended or something which is reprehensible or something which is prohibited, a lot of people are like, oh, this is too legalistic. It's always discussing prohibitions. It's always discussing what is recommended or what is obligatory. What we don't realize is there's a reason behind these laws. Sure. In Usul al-Fiqh, in mm -hmm. the principles of jurisprudence, we recognize a number of terms milak irada i'tibar bayan and kishaf all of these terms 
allow us to understand there is a reason behind God's laws. Absolutely. When we find out what God's laws are, it's then up to us to be able to follow them in order that we're able to reach spiritual bliss. Absolutely. Many times in the books of Principles of Jurisprudence, you'll see that the aims of these laws are so that the human being reaches sa'ada. Right. I'm on a journey towards the spiritual bliss. I recognize that there's a broad spectrum between pure light okay. and the lower self. Right. Pure light is as close as I am to my reality, that ruh that's breathed into me. Okay. And the lower self is really when I'm going towards the animalistic taking over uh, that rational human representative of God on earth. Uh -huh. Therefore, when our communities say that if we're discussing law so much, that means there is no spirituality. It's been suppressed. Maybe. What we're not realizing is that, no, on the contrary, when you're being told that something is obligatory upon you, the Lord has expressed it, there's the bayan, you found it, now it's up to you to follow it so that you are showing that obedience which the Lord deserves, which in turn allows for your growth from the lower self towards pure light. Okay. When something is halal, for example, or when, for example, when something is wajib, that act which you are told is obligatory, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care if you perform that act or no. Rather, in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't benefit from you performing that act. Yeah, sure. Rather, it is you, the human being, who grows spiritually through the performance of that act which is obligatory. Okay. If we take the flip side, when somebody is telling you that there is an act which is prohibited, something is haram, God doesn't arbitrarily just say, you know what, I'm just going to randomly choose what's haram and what's halal for you. When something is prohibited, it's because it's taking you away from that path to spiritual bliss, that path to move from the mundane mm -hmm. towards the heavenly and divine. Right. So therefore, when somebody says to me, what are one of the ways in which I can become more spiritual? You find many of the, time, many of the times that Imams of Ahlul Bayt tell you, do that which is obligatory, stay away from that which is prohibited. Yeah, sure. It always seems to be such a basic formula. Absolutely. But what people aren't realizing is, you are recognizing there is wisdom behind the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to grow and actualize our potential. potential yeah. There's a recognition that there are battles that are happening... With the ego. With the ego. Yeah. And one may argue that the ego is our identity. Yeah. Yeah. Where I am, whether it's, you know, nafsul lawama, sometimes you read nafsul ammara, sometimes you read nafsul mutmainna, where I am is my identity in reality. Yes. Otherwise, society is really dead men walking unless a True. person reflects on what their spiritual existence means. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think we should negate right. having legal discussions or the stress on law that Ahlul Bayt salam, virtually sacrificed their lives so that we would inherit that heritage. Yeah. Because I think that's part of the spiritual journey. And, and if I'm not mistaken, that actually is the foundation, as it were. And also, I mean, if I play devil's advocate for a moment, one may ask, well, why do I have to do this as it were or comply with these commands but <coughs> but correct me if i'm wrong that also is a part is part and parcel of faith it's not necessary for one to know the reason why he is complying with actually praying on time fasting these are commands that allah talks about in his divine realm of wisdom hikmah and maybe perhaps you could say also this is a form of ubudiyah well i i think when you're looking at the acts of worship which we are told to perform, mm. 
those acts of worship were even told exactly how they allow us to grow spiritually. Right. When you're reading a line in the Quran, for example, in the tanha an al fahshai wal munkar, right. that prayer keeps you away from evil and indecency, mm -hmm. for the remembrance of Allah is greater. What we're seeing over here is a couple of key ingredients to our growth spiritually. That number one, one of the acts that we have made obligatory upon you five times a day is an act for your benefit. Because that act, when you are undertaking it, you are A, going towards spiritual bliss, the world of Sa'ada. Right. And B, you're staying away from evil and indecency. Okay. Islam doesn't want us to go towards the world of the individual. It wants us to also grow within us a sense of duty. Right. The paradigm that we live in today is the world of the individual and what makes the individual feel happy. Sure. There's also a sense that in my spiritual growth, there's a societal growth. Okay, okay. But in my spiritual heedlessness, mm -hmm. there's a societal heedlessness. Okay. So for example, when someone says to me, I'm just going to pray salah. I don't need to know what the benefits of salah are. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is telling you yeah. that someone who observes salah properly, because you know, someone can easily turn around and say, well, I pray, but it hasn't stopped me from doing haram. It doesn't have to be a direct correlation at that moment. But the more you pray, the more you wake up for fajr, the more you establish these uh, prayers, the more that correlation is going to come together in your life. You see, if you're going to be a, a football player and you're yeah. taking a free kick outside of the box and someone says, you know what, if you practice free kicks, you're going to score. You practice five free kicks that afternoon, ten free kicks that afternoon, you keep hit hitting the bar. Yeah. But then if you keep on practicing with the aim that I want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with the aim that I want to infuse the love of Allah into my heart. So if we go back to the football metaphor, I keep on practicing because my aim is to make sure that I do well for my football club. So every morning I'm going to keep practice. Every morning, eventually, you're going to be scoring from those free kicks. Yes. yes. When, when I remember reading about the likes of David Beckham, for example, mm -hmm. uh, how David Beckham would s literally in the park would continuously keep taking free kicks, keep taking free kicks. It wasn't that he attained that perfection in the free kick from day one. He recognized it's a journey. He recognized the exercises keep having to be performed until eventually, I think it reached a stage in the late 90s where there wasn't a free kick of his, but it was going into the bottom yeah, corner. Yeah, and I sadly remember some of those afternoons. So when, when we're looking likewise with Salah, with Salah, for example, God's telling us that, listen, this act of prayer, if you do it properly, don't think in one day you're going to achieve this spiritual bliss in prayer. Because there are some people who pray out there and then they're like, well, you know what, it's not really not doing anything for me, I'm going to stop. Mm. No, you continue. And then eventually, even like fasting, someone might say fast because your parents do it, or fast because the community does it. Yeah. Or fast, you don't have to know the reason for it. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said that this practice that I've told you is obligatory for you, which I've prescribed for those before you, is that you achieve a level of God consciousness in your mm -hmm. life. And if you ask anyone who fasts in the holy month of Ramadan, they'll say to you, there's a spiritual moment that takes me above the main mundane that everybody else is living in, where I suddenly recognize just how many blessings Allah has showered upon me that I can look forward to a sumptuous meal yeah. and others cannot. What spiritual growth emerges here? Look, the lower self human being is suddenly now in this constant movement, not just to the higher self, but towards the world of pure light, yeah, yeah. which is the origin in the world of the soul. Yes. So I think with every act of worship in the religion of Islam, 
instead of our paradigm being one that irrespective of whether we know what God intends or not, no, on the contrary, you'll find that all of these acts, salah, psalm, zakat means purification. Yeah. But the act of giving, giving. continues to purify you. Because you're not that individual anymore. You, there's a sense of civic duty, national duty, religious duty. It builds you as a human being. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, moving away from the religious aspects, as it were, do you think spirituality, obviously spirituality differs in the world today. So that's one point. And the second point is, do you think in some forms, perhaps some people have a personal view in terms of it being too materialistic or someone is being too materialistic in terms of As in, in this desires. world, the world's yeah, become yeah. too material. I think... Because I'd, I think this is quite important for Yeah, I don't view. want to generalize yeah. the whole world and say everybody's become too materialistic. Right. You see, I always have a disclaimer, which my teachers taught me whenever you're talking about spirituality. I'm not talking about spirituality because I am God's gift of spirituality. Let's right. be clear here. Yeah. Spirituality is the core of Islam. It's difficult to talk about the core of the core. Mm -hmm. I may be one of those people who has a material or materialistic element in his character. But I can also hope that I can balance that because we don't want the wrong spiritual no. worldview as well to no, emerge, no. which we'll, we'll come, come to. as well. Yeah. When we're looking at the materialistic, there may be people out there who look materialistic. Mm -hmm. But how do you know what charity he gives to people when you're not there? Yeah. If you're saying to me there are people even out there who are super hungry bankers who don't care about anything but their bonus and their mortgage. They couldn't care less if the money they were making was trading for companies out there who are just feeding off the blood of innocent kids finding diamonds for them. Let's yeah. say. Yeah. Even that person, as long as they haven't reached a level of hard-heartedness. Okay. okay. This is fundamental that's a, that's because the, the heart in Islamic thought is fundamental to the growth of the human being spiritually. And it's known as the Qalb mm -hmm. because there is a constant rotating of its position yeah. and one may argue its journey. But what you don't want is the heart to become Hard hardened. Qasayat al qulub you know, it's like Qaswat al qulub it's like this really hard heart hard-heartedness that begins to envelope you where I've heard stories of football players yeah. who have burnt money because they make so much they've burnt it in nightclubs they burnt it so you know you smoke the the 50 pound note no. that's a hard-heartedness issue that you've reached you've reached a state of hard-heartedness you know there's kids in Africa mm -hmm. who have to travel miles to get clean water. Yeah. And you have the audacity to light a cigarette but with a 50 pound or a hundred dollar note. There are people who go to nightclubs and those people who go to nightclubs will order champagne without drinking it or order champagne to show off who has the most bottles on their table. table. Yeah. That's hard-heartedness. We're no longer talking about the physical aspects of the life of the human being. We're talking about disease. Yeah, absolutely. And what's, what's happening here is that when we're looking at the world today, it's sad that there are human beings who in one week will have a wonderful charity fundraiser and the following week find it no problem to open a bottle of champagne worth a few thousand pounds and leave that bottle there simply to show off that their table had the most drinks yeah. or could afford the most expensive drink. At that moment is when 
the world is in a crisis. Right. And I think part of the jahiliya world that the Prophet, peace be upon his family, encounters is, <laughs> is a world where it was all about what makes me happy as an individual. Excessive worth, maybe? Not even that. What makes me happy as an individual in the sense that if I want to plunder that tribe, I'll do it. Right. If I want to have a drink at any time and it doesn't matter if it hurts somebody else or even hurts my family, it doesn't matter. That sense, which I keep coming back to, of a, of a duty mm -hmm. to ensure that this trust that God gave you, the spirit that's breathed into you, that allows you to be who you are, his rep, which is a great honor, yeah. which I think many Muslims don't reflect on just no, how no. great an honor it is to be known as the ex of Allah wow. or the ex of God, meaning the, the caliph of God on earth. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the world that we live in, materialism exists. Materialism is not always negative, except when a person begins to move into this arena of complete hard-heartedness mm -hmm. where there is no sense of duty to the creation nor the creator. But often people talk about how they are stung in life. So let's talk about maybe the wrong spirituality which you've alluded to just now, which clearly is the wrong method or it's you know the hard-heartedness of the heart which has made man forget himself, really, as the Holy Quran talks about. You have forgotten yourself, so I've forgotten you. Yeah. Um, but what essentially is the wrong spirituality? Is it? Is it? it can it be something as a definition for wrong spirituality? I think even in the Quran, God talks of a wrong spirituality. In the Quran, you'll find, I think, in chapter fifty-seven of the Quran, God talks of an innovated asceticism. Okay. It's a form of asceticism and people love to call themselves ascetic. Uh -huh. Because the moment you enter the world of gnosis and, and spiritual enlightenment, you want to hear about the esoteric and you want to say that I'm ascetic. And these terms people love, but these can also be manifested in the wrong ways. Yeah, For example, sure, sure. there are those who say, that I will remain celibate because celibacy is a path to the Lord. Yeah. In Islam, that's seen as an innovated asceticism. Mm -hmm. Get married, have your children, procreate, be proud of that child, allow the growth of that child. So therefore you find that even it reached a stage in Islam where there were woman who would say, I don't want to get married. And these women would be asked, why not? They'll be like, because I want to devote my life to God. Yeah. And the reply that came that if not getting married was a sign of spirituality, then Fatima al-Zahra salam would not have not got married. married. But she got married. She moved from being a daughter to being a wife, to being a mother, to being a spiritual exemplar for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Then you've got others who, for example, will say that I will not necessarily wash myself. And what they don't realize is iman, cleanliness is a part of faith. But you'll find that I, I tell you, you can go to certain very holy cities in the Islamic world okay. and you can hug a Mawlana and it's a death wish. It's not a, it's not a moment of bliss. And that person, you're like Mawlana, spiritual, you've been told all these great things, but basic fragrance, yeah, sure. basic fragrance on the beard is completely missing. Yeah. Okay, and that person, he's telling you that this is how you should be spiritual. This is the tasbih you should do. This is the du'as you should read. But there's a basic element here and that the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family allowed us to be extravagant in, you know, perfuming ourselves. Mm, absolutely, you know? that's right. So that could also be a wrong spirituality as well. Okay, okay. And I think what begins to happen in early Islam, there's the famous example where one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family is known to now suddenly have adopted this ascetic way. Mm -hmm. Uthman bin Mad'un. Right. And Uthman bin Mad'un's wife is seen by Aisha, the wife of the Prophet. And 
she asks, so why are you in such a disheveled state? You know, you were such a good looking lady and now you just let go. Okay. And she's like, who should I be good looking for? My husband doesn't come near me. All he does is spend the whole day in prayers and fasting. Right. And he doesn't eat meat anymore. Okay. You know, and, and what happens then is that this hurts the Prophet Muhammad when he hears that this is a wrong spirituality you guys have adopted. We don't want you to go into a spirituality where you condemn everything that's in this world. We want you to be a, 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 an ummah, which is a balanced middle mm. ummah, a middle path, yes. a community. And, and so we do have to be careful when we do sometimes meet people. And I, listen, I've met people who are known to be, supposedly they are people of spirituality. Their salam is the, soul, uh, the coldest salam. They're, they're meant to be spiritual embodiments. When they say salam alaykum to you, salam alaykum. Okay, like, do you want to ask about how I am or how's my family or? You know, I try and make an effort that if someone says salam alaykum to me as much as I can, not in the name of spirituality, mm -hmm. but in the name of that walaya right. that exists, not yeah. we laya, we laya. Right. Right. That fraternity between the lovers of Ahlul Bayt That when you see each other, you try and embrace each other. You try and make sure that the person feels your warmth. And then you see some dressed in the clerical garb. Okay. Not all. There no, are some no. who are wonderful examples. Sure. But there are, there are some dressed in the clerical garbs and walking around with a sibha and you know, all looking holy and pristine and so on. And then, salamu alaykum. Salamu alaykum. Now that's a wrong spirituality. That's not the spirituality. Or sitting down, there's no real sense of, I hope everything's okay, can I help you in anything? These are all small spiritual points, mm. which are much bigger than you reading Dua Abu Hamza Thamali 24-7. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so there is this wrong spirituality that certainly can arise. You know, you got, you got people who, will sit by the grave of, of, a, of a member of Ahlul Bayt reading dua the whole night. But these same people have got immense hatred and envy of people who are more famous than them. Yeah, yeah. Or people who have achieved plaudits that they haven't. But these people will come back looking religious, looking spiritual. And I think that that wrong spirituality of how the garb and the rosary bead is the defining point. That's another point of wrong spirituality. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll talk about um, some of the methods and challenges um, that Muslims face, as mm. it were, in attaining spirituality. But just before then, in terms of the spiritual aspects, as it were, do you think society, and I'm giving examples now, society, the way one has been brought up, parents, tarbiya, as it were, what influences one to be spiritual? Now, obviously, first and foremost, one's got to have the niyyah to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've spoken and you've described... I think you've hit the nail on the head. Even you've, you've answered the question with that one line. Right. And I'll tell you why. Because I think parents have a role in one's spirituality, but not the ultimate role. No. Society has a role in one's spirituality, but not the ultimate role. Okay. Parents, let's, let's look at this. Parents, yeah. for example. We're indebted to our parents for how many sacrifices they made mm. to show us which spiritual road to take. But that doesn't guarantee that two sons are the same. Yeah. Well, that doesn't guarantee that the three daughters at home are the same. The parents show the road. The parents try and explain to you God, the attributes of God, mm -hmm. the blessings, the bounties of God. And one of you decides, yes, but the other two of you say no. Yeah. The parents can have an impact on our spirituality. But then you'll sometimes find that in one family, you may have a son who's just gone to Hajj and another who's not interested in any of these things. Yeah, yeah. 
So are parents the be all and end all? No. no. They're a decisive factor, but not right. everything. Okay. Now, society. Someone says, you know, if I lived in Najaf, mm. I'd be so religious. Yeah, good point. But it's because I live in London that I'm not religious. Y you, <laughs> you been to these cities or no? Someone says, if I lived in Karbala, if I lived in Qom, if I lived in Medina, if I lived in Cairo, whatever. Yeah. Then I'm going to be really religious. There are people in some of the societies or some of the places I've mentioned who are sitting at a calf five minutes from the grave of Imam al Hussein or five minutes away from the grave of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, and they're cursing blatantly. There are people who could be living in a society seen as majority Muslim in a country, majority Muslim environment, majority Muslim. Don't pray. We live in a society that's not majority Muslim. Yeah. And I could say that the youth in the West have made immense strides in the protection of God's message and the message of the Prophet and his family. Right. So therefore, society can have an effect. Okay. But not the be all and end all. You hit the nail on the head when you said, the major effector is you. Mm. The cure is within you. you. The disease is within you. There's a piece of poetry attributed to Imam Ali, Ali alayhi salam. That's right. دواءك منك وما تبصر وداءك فيك وما تشعر أنت الكتاب المبين الذي بأحرفه يظهر المضمر تحسب أنك جرم صغير وفيك انطوى العالم الأكبر The cure is within you but you don't see The disease is within you but you don't sense You are the open book who With your creation the unseen can be seen do you think you're something small when the whole universe exists within you? You, the human being, have God's spirit breathed into you. Yeah. It's such a magnificent creation that even when the Quran says they ask you about the ruh, say I've only been told a little about it. We don't know exactly Sorry. because our minds can't comprehend no, no, what totally. that ruh is. Therefore, when a person says to me, parents, it's because of them I'm not religious or I am religious. Society, it's because of it I am religious. I'm, buddy, you've got the free, free will, will. Exactly, I was going to just mention the same word. To be on the spiritual path or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's your free will. You have the free will to find a place in your heart for your mum. Yes. For your wife. You know, sometimes when I'm talking to my wife, if I, I say to her something like, Ruhi, <laughs> Galbi. Now, I don't say, Edi, Ridgely. I don't say, My hand. <laughs> You're my feet. No, what do yeah. I say? Galbi, Ruhi. When I say that, why am I pointing to you are my heart? You're my soul. Because I've realized that I want to find a space for that person in my life, in the deepest, most important, most sensitive area, my heart. You know, the heart is physically or spiritually is of the utmost importance. Yeah. And both times in the Quran, and with both concepts, you'll find the heart, qalb, protected by sadr. Okay. And when it comes to the spiritual understanding of the heart, it's also, Rabbi shrah li sadri. There's that sadr that covers it. And what I need to do is I need to allow the light of my mum, for example. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, mum, galbi, ruhi. My wife, galbi, ruhi. My brothers and sisters, galbi, ruhi. When I'm saying that is, I'm saying to them, 
I don't see you as my hands or my feet. You are my heart, my ruh. Now, this is the point. The main factor in spiritual bliss is the moment you decide to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more beloved to you than your own parents by finding that place for Allah to now take over your heart. SubhanAllah. And that's where you'll find these unbelievable traditions. Islam and especially Shiism. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't want anyone out there saying, oh, if you mention Shiism sectarian, listen, buddy, there's a difference between a Ferrari, a Lambo and a random car. car. <laughs> when you're looking at the words of Al Muhammad, you're talking La Ferrari, you're talking... You know, you're talking Aventadore S, you're talking different league. When they are able to tell you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words outside of the Quran, a hadith Qudsi or hadith Qudsi, mm -hmm. these hadith Qudsis that we read, of course, there is a belief that these are the, the paraphrased words of Allah through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. We discuss this sometimes yeah, when we're sure. looking in Usul al-Fiqh on these areas. So, the earth and the heavens cannot contain me. Look, look at this line. Subhanahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the earth and the heavens cannot contain, contain me. me. But the heart of my believing servant can contain me. This is phenomenal. Meaning that, you know what? If you find a place, and of course we're not talking physically find a place for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, uh, that's a distorted view, the idea that you can find a place for Allah. You're limiting and that which is limited should not be worshipped. But rather you're allowing Allah to enter, enter your life. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the earth, the heavens. Nah, that wasn't where I wanted to reside. I wanted to reside in the heart of the believer. And that's why many times we say that we're getting closer to Allah through the remembrance of Allah. But not remembrance out of fear. Oh, Allah, you know, I'm scared. I'm going to get... No, rather it's just like, you know what, God, my mom and my dad and my family and my friends, I put them in my heart because I'm grateful for what they did for me. Yeah. They don't even come near anything you did for me. SubhanAllah. And if I lose all of them, while I know that I have you, I don't need anything else. Yes, yes. And that's why in Dua Kumail, that wonderful line. Allahumma, inni ataqarrabu ilayka bi dhikrik. Oh Allah, I get nearer to you through your remembrance. And this area of dhikr, mm -hmm. we need to come to for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because we remember a lot of things. There's only certain things you remember with love that you leave in your heart. Yeah. I mean, you, you spoke about a dhikr and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Holy Quran, remember me and I'll remember you. Mm -hmm. We'll come to the point about yeah. dhikr. We've got just a few minutes left for the sh first break. I just wanted to read um, a small part of Nahj Balaga in English from uh, Amir al Mamli and Ali yeah. ibn Talib al Islam. O oh God, illuminate my outward with the light of obedience to thee, and my inner being with thy love, my heart with thy knowledge of thee, my spirit with thy vision, mm. and my inmost consciousness, sir, with the independence of attachment to thy threshold. O oh Lord of majesty and magnificence. Now this obviously is a parallel to the quote that you mentioned from um, Dua Kumail, as it were. Now let's go forward now, inshallah, and we'll probably continue this after the break in terms of the methods. We're slowly now moving from this Holy Mother, the Hajj, into now Muharram. And after Muharram, the subsequent month is naturally Safar. At times, not all people, at times, let's be honest, we get forgetful. We go back to our lives, enjoyment, work, and so on and so forth. But in Muharram, there tends to be 
a high frequency, as it were, of the uh, remembrance of Muhammad Allah Hussain Allah Allah and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that holy Ahl al-Bayt al-Islam, the message of Karbala. There's a thousand doors are open from the message or the university as I'd like to call it from Karbala in terms of justice, how you are with people and so on and so forth. Yeah. But what can we learn from the Ahlul Bayt al Islam, Ziyarats, the word Majalis? And we'll continue this after the break. Inshallah. What yeah. do you what do you what what would you hope to offer to the audience as it were or listeners? How can we maintain this level? What should one do? Well, I think you know, Muharram's a miracle. Yeah. The Ashura remembrance, the Ashura eulogies, these are miracles and these are blessings for us. And these are us honoring those who help you on the path of spiritual bliss. In Ziyara, we say, Inni ataqarrabu ilallah, because ultimately I want to get nearer to Allah, to Allah. subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ وَإِلَىٰ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِلَىٰ فَاطِمَ وَإِلَىٰ الْحَسَنِ وَإِلَىٰ الْحُسَيْنِ بِمُوَالَاتِكُمْ وَبِالْبَرَاءَةِ مِنْ أَعْدَائِكُمْ I get closer to Allah, in turn get closer to the Prophet, <coughs> peace be upon him and his family, in turn to Imam Ali alayhi salam, in turn to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, in turn to Sayyidah Shabab al jannah how do I get close? Through holding on to their wilaya. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I'm doing in the month of Muharram is holding on to the guardianship right. of Ahl al-Bayt When I'm saying holding on to the guardianship, the guardianship mm -hmm. bestowed upon them right. by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they become A, sabab al-muttasal bayna al-ardi wa sama They are the connection between the people of the earth and the people of the heavens. In Dua Nutba we say, where is the one who is the connector between the heavens and the earth? Connector in which sense? Through following them, through learning about them, through studying them. Uh -huh. I am now placing in my heart Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love and the love of those who Allah loves. Even in the Quran, the Prophet peace be upon him, his family says, <coughs> say if you love Allah, follow me. Follow me. Allah will love you. Because someone might turn around and say, listen, this uh, Prophet, Ahl al-Bayt, I respect these things, <laughs> yeah, but we don't need yeah. to mention them. The main thing is Allah. No. Allah in the Quran says. It's a command. Qul. Say. In kuntum Allah Allah. Say, if you claim to love Allah, follow me. Allah will love you. Meaning that in Muharram, I'm following what my Prophet taught me to follow in honoring his grandson. For he said, he is a part of me and I am a part of him. Yes. And whoever Allah loves the one who loves him. Therefore in Muharram, I believe it's a wonderful opportunity for you to remove some of the hard heartedness that may have grown. Yes. Start to chisel that out. Mm -hmm. You may still have a bit of vengeance against a certain family member. You may still have a bit of animosity to someone who's hurt you. You may just be someone who enjoys causing rifts and trouble between family members. Chisel that out of your life. Right, right. And let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet, and the Ahlul Bayt <coughs> into your lives. Yeah. So now, sorry, we're going to have to go for a short break. Our viewers, do join us just after a few minutes, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussain TV. 
with me tonight we have Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Sayyidna, Asalaamu Alaikum. So just before the break, uh, we were discussing and analysing the season, as it were, of Muharram and what we can actually digest from there. And you were mentioning about, you know, chiselling away that hard heartness as it were, um, envy, perhaps animosity towards certain individuals, you know, really letting go. So just really going back to that and continuing on from there. Because I, I, I really do believe that yeah. we have to be careful upon reflection about the spiritual diseases that we have. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I find out that I have a, a physical disease, I'm going to straight away go to the pharmacist, go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that I get this cured as soon as possible. And I am sad that sometimes in society, people don't reflect as much on the spiritual diseases that they have. If I'm someone who, for example, <coughs> has got certain spiritual diseases, and we can group spiritual diseases such as lust, envy, yeah. arrogance, yeah. anger, uh, hypocrisy. You know, these aren't something I can just go to Boots Chemist and say, no, no, no. Uh, good afternoon, I would like uh, paracetamol for um, anger. Or I would like paracetamol for hypocrisy. I'm a munafiq and I need uh, two tablets, please. Person will look at you and say either, you know, if security can take this person out, if you don't mind. Or they'll say, sorry, we don't prescribe for these things. Hypocrisy is your, your thought and awareness that you rationally decided to be two-faced. You know, it's got nothing to do with your physical state. This is your spiritual state. And therefore... I have to try myself, if I'm seeing that I've got these spiritual diseases, maybe I'm the type who enjoys gossiping, I enjoy mm. backbiting, I enjoy destroying people's lives. Maybe the month of Muharram comes as a blessing. There are certain days in the Quran, Allah describes them as the days of Allah. Yeah. The days where Allah shared his blessings. For example, when Moses was given victory over Pharaoh. This is one of the days in which the grace of Allah was showered upon okay. man. And I think that is what happens in Muharram, that these are days of God. Um, they allow us to remember Imam al-Hussein And as part of my paradigm on religious culture being beneficial for the growth of humanity, I believe that every religion has certain symbolic moments or practices okay. that an atheist world can never come and replace. Mm. Because those moments are always going to be better than an atheist worldview moment. Right. And what I mean by that is, for example, in Muharram, even giving out food at the end of the majlis is a spiritual act. Because if your intention is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in my heart and this is in honor of one of the people who sought to protect the message of Allah, namely Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, that becomes a spiritual act. Likewise, if you're helping in the car park of the mosque. However, mm -hmm. even in these acts in Muharram, yeah. a person has to be aware of the wrong spirituality. Of what course. do I mean? I help in the car park in Muharram, say, for the last 20 years of my life. My dad's helped. My granddad's helped. My cousins have helped. I virtually inherited it. Right. Yes. Yes. But for 10 nights of Muharram, I get my car park jacket on. And I've traveled virtually all the continents, given Majas, all the continents. And I have a great respect for those people who stand on these cold nights. However, are you standing there? Or is your standing there a service to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's majalis and in turn to Allah? Or has it become an excuse to chill for a couple of hours with a cigarette? Yeah, yeah. Well said. Because what begins to happen is shaitan, who obviously is a major obstacle and challenge in our spiritual growth, Iblis is going to make sure that, you know what? You stay here outside, don't go inside. Mm. No, no, but you're not going inside the majlis because you're outside looking after the cars or you're cooking and you're cooking for Imam al Hussein. Therefore, because you're cooking for Imam al Hussein, you are an extremely spiritual person. Imam al Hussein is telling us part of your growth spiritually is gaining knowledge. Yes. 
Yes. Why are you standing outside for 10 nights? No, well, you know, if I don't stand outside, then the cars won't be properly. Or if I'm not in the kitchen cooking food. No one else is going to do it. No one else is going to do it. No, there are people going to do it. You did it last year. There are others who want to do it. Now, don't make a kingdom mm -hmm. in terms of your volunteering. Mm -hmm. yeah. I bring me and my buddies to volunteer. Yeah. yeah. And then we're having a good chit chat outside while the <laughs> Majlis of Hussein is going on. Because I've seen a wrong spirituality develop even in relation to our Muharram Ajals. And it's a shame yeah. when a person says, for example, you know what, I'm standing outside. Uh, why? Because, well, the main time I want to come inside is when there's the morning rituals of mm. lamentation rather than the lecture. Yeah, but you've missed the point. Yeah, sure. There's a 45 minute analysis of how you can grow, grow. spiritually as a human being. Yes. So... The Majalis of Imam Al-Hussein are a wonderful spiritual gift which the Ahl al-Bayt loved. Mm -hmm. Imam Al-Rada loved telling Da'b al-Bin Ali al-Khuzai, recite the Masaib of Hussein yes. Imam Al-Baqir trained 141 poets, that's in my conclusion, others may differ, to recite the Musibah of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam. But within that religious culture of Muharram, generosity, altruism, humility. Do you know how many times when we were growing up, there was a fight when food was being served? Do you know how many times? Well, I remember when growing up, and you know, you may be from the Indo-Pak subcontinent, yeah. you may have seen different things, but I... Remember growing up that people when food would come out yeah. at the end of the majlis There'd be a scrum for the food in some cases a punch-up Wow Now we've missed the whole point here. Yeah, that majlis spiritually is meant to make me grow and become a better human being I'm growing I'm reflecting on the I Making it a we yeah but if it's all going back to I, and it's all about me, then I've missed the point. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, there needs to be a reflection. Yeah. yeah. Dear viewers, do call in. Um, you have certain mediums to actually communicate your messages via Facebook, WhatsApp. The telephone number is 0203 515 0199. Once again, the telephone number is 0203 515 0199. Sayyidina, um, there's a key question for tonight's topic, and I think we need to sort of address this, as it were, ethically speaking, from a point of view of faith and what Islam talks about and what uh, we should really endeavor to do. But how can one, is God listening? To, to our um, invocations? Does God listen? Is there some sort of proof? Can we substantiate that? What, does, what would you say about that? I think the ayah in the Qur'an is wonderful. Right. And the ayah tells you, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my servant asks you about me, tell them that I'm near. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِي I will answer the supplication of the supplicant when they supplicate towards me. Now, a couple of issues arise here. Mm -hmm. Firstly, how near? Well, what's the nearest thing to you? Your juggler? I'm closer to you than your juggler. Another verse in the Quran. Secondly, will he answer my supplications? He tells us in the Quran, Call upon me. I'll answer, and I'll answer you. you. There are many doors in this world that close. Allah's doors always open. You are a witness to that on the day of Arafah. Yeah. Those few hours, for you to sit there and know that everything's been forgiven, how then could you doubt that your Lord ever forgotten you? Yeah, all these people who sat there didn't even have to recite a du'a. No. Just sit there. Just sit there. From midday until Maghrib. Maghrib. And if you doubted that you'd been forgiven, Hajj done. That level of mercy. I remember one of my teachers telling me there was an idol worshipper, idol in Arabic, Sanam. Okay. 
So when he goes to the Sanam, he says Sanam, Sanam, Sanam. He accidentally said Samad. And at that moment, there was a call. I hear you, my servant. Look at that. Subhanallah. He's been saying, Sanam. he's been an idol worshiper. And he's been saying Sanam. Mm -hmm. Idol, idol, idol. Then he accidentally said Samad. Qul huwa Allah. Ahad, Allah, Samad. Because he accidentally called out Samad, Allah said, My servant, I hear you. So now we just have a telephone uh, caller. Um, Salaamu Alaikum. Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. My name is Abbas. I'm calling from South London. Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Abbas, yes, brother, your question, please. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum, Sayyid. My question is, is that with spirituality, so you think it's a bit subjective and maybe plays on the people's minds and it's to do with people's emotions rather than actual scientific facts? Right. Excuse me, just recovering from a cold. Yeah. Um, in terms of... This point has been mentioned by many who believe in a materialist worldview. Mm -hmm. They say that there really is no, uh, no such thing as a soul or a spirit. Yeah, we're now dwelling into the unseen now. Yeah. And, um, and so therefore people say, well, how exactly can you show that that exists? And, I, and there are so many different ways. I think that needs its own show. Inshallah. To look at the Aristotelian worldview, to look at the worldview of certain philosophers mm -hmm. in the, you know, in a few centuries ago who were living in, <laughs> in Iran and so on. And to look at you know, their different opinions on how we can prove this. But there are a number of key areas. Firstly, there are certain people out there who had physical issues and they took so much medication to recover from those physical issues and they don't work. Yeah. When you ask them, what is it that works? They'd mention to you something not physical. Sometimes they'll say to you, my love of my Lord got me through this. Yeah. The person has tried the medication which has been prescribed, but then points to a non-medical issue, love. Nothing to do with the physical human being, but rather he says love. Others say no, my faith got me through mm. at the end. We were taking medications, there was no improvement, there was nothing but my faith. I held on to a faith that my Lord will help me out here. Yes. These areas, love, faith, awareness of one's religious beliefs, all of these are not to be quantified right. or to be compartmentalized physically. So therefore, from one angle, you've got the clear conclusions from the lives of people who mention non-physical moments That's in their exactly, life having yes. a major effect on their physical strength. Yeah, yeah. That's one angle to look at it. Then even when we mentioned earlier spiritual diseases, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think anyone out there will say hypocrisy is a physical construct in the right side of the Brain or frontal something. lobe or something. Yeah. Hypocrisy is the free will of the human being where they decide to act in a two-faced manner and that begins to affect their character generally. So when we're talking about envy, we're talking about greed, we're not talking about physical diseases in the human being. There is no envy ward at any hospital. Mm -hmm. There's no greed ward at a hospital. Is there a, even a gambling ward at a hospital where you say, you know, I've got an addiction for gambling. <laughs> we reply by saying that that's a spiritual disease that you have. But upon reflection, upon being aware of your surroundings, upon thinking about the blessings that the Lord's <laughs> given you and remembering the Lord, these help you leave these spiritual diseases. Yes. Yes. So... 
you've got a number of examples there and there's many more, especially when we want to talk about you know, how certain people at the age of 16 were known as patient. The body continues till the age of 50, 60, 70 with many changes. Sure. Yes. But yes. the aspect of their patience remains an attribute, which is a spiritual attribute separate from their physical existence. Yes, yes. Okay. If I was to remember someone and I say, that person, for example, is someone who at the age of 15, at the age of 18, displayed an immense amount of patience. Yeah. The body changed, 25, 45, 65, 70. But that principle, which is a spiritual, ethical principle, was separate from separate, the physical yes. changes that Absolutely. were happening. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So, this and there's other ways as well. There may be some people paralyzed physically. Mm -hmm. Okay. This paralyzed physically, but you'll find that certain spiritual attributes remain with them even though physically the person can't move. Yes, that's right. Their faith remains yeah, intact. Yeah. Their love for Ahl al-Bayt remained intact. Mm -hmm. Their dignity they remained in, maintained intact. Of course, somebody who believes that I'm just an animal who was born or who exists because of a set of accidents, that person sees this world as a circus. Yeah. I'm a player in the circus. Yeah. I'm eventually going to die in this circus play. We're all going to die and that's it. Mm -hmm. That person, in all honesty, I don't know what happened to them in their early years which made them really hate religion and hate God. Something's really pissed them off. There's no yeah. doubt about that. But I think for us, no. We recognize that there is within us a spiritual and a material existence, even intuitively. Right. Intuitively, there are statements that I make which have got nothing to do with my physical existence. I'm in awe of the altruism of that person. Now people can give a hundred lectures on the evolution of the altruism of the human being. Believe you me, there are still human beings yeah. who have no altruism. It requires exercises, requires reflection upon God's bounties for me to come to that level where I'm willing to hurt myself so that others grow. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. there's many other ways. Yeah, that we sure. Doing. We have um, two questions here. They're slightly off topic if you don't mind in um, taking to answer. The society today is quite progressive and to this end we have also seen a lot of women pursuing careers, which is encouraging. However, if it comes to deciding between career and marriage, e.g. delaying marriage, then what are the Islamic injunctions for women? That's the first question. Well, I think uh, Islamically, it's, uh, the, uh, you know, women in our community uh, there is no problem with them working mm -hmm. and there is no problem with them seeking to find a suitable partner in that progression that's happening in the in their career so if for example someone finds a suitable partner um, at the beginning of their career yeah there's no issue you know they can move on in their life and uh, if they don't find that suitable partner they could continue in their career until they meet someone and they discuss sure. with each other's world view yeah yeah now, naturally we if if you're reaching a stage where you're falling into the world of sin or you fear for your spirituality, then there should be a bit more emphasis there yes. on seeking to be in a relationship if you fear for your chastity or your modesty. And this applies to the men as well. Right. That, you know, they say that marriage is a sunnah but becomes obligatory if a person is going to uh, fear for their chastity and yeah, their modesty. Yeah, go astray or something. Go astray and so on. Yeah. yeah. The second question is, I want to ask a question regarding salah. Is it necessary to pray Zohar and Asr together or can we pray separately? Same goes for Maghrib and Isha. Also, can we pray Zohar and Asr just before Maghrib due to some reason? So that some reason I'm assuming would be, for example, delay, constraints, work, not having an available space. You know, so what, what is the effectly... Um, we we, we find in the in the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, he was known to separate prayers mm -hmm. and he was known to combine the prayers. Why? Is there, is there a reason for that? Just sort of the view the reason is very clear and it's in, it's in the texts of all the schools of Islam that when they asked him, why would you combine? Mm -hmm. And he replied, uh, this religion has come to bring you e uh, ease and not hardship. Right. So the combination aspect is there. Yep. Uh, where a person <coughs> is able to combine or they can separate. Now, it, 
even spiritually, when it comes to your relationship with prayer, does your day revolve around God or does God revolve around your day? Yes. And what I mean by that is that, say a group of friends want to meet for lunch and Dhuhr these days, let's say, is at 110. Mm -hmm. Now, we can all say, okay, let's all meet at 130 for lunch. But you're thinking, hold on, if I we're going to meet 130 for lunch, I'm not going to get there in time because I may live about half an hour away. Yeah. Salah, will I make it? I'll just get there to pray. Or the group of you can come to a joint decision that, listen, exactly. why not me at two? That's right. You know, that'll allow us to pray, allow us to meet, allow us to meet in comfort. We've prioritized the Lord because of the bounties the Lord's given us. We've taken a step towards God. He's going to take 10 towards us. Yeah. We're running out of time. So let's just quickly go to um, some further aspects of tonight's topic in terms of spirituality. Um, the, for every action, there has to be a near, or there should be a near, as it were, in terms of what one should do and why they're doing it. So in terms of defining and dhikr and remembrance, what should culminate <coughs> in terms of dhikr. So, for example, what I mean by that is, what should be the frame of mind um, and the heart, the presence of the heart? How should one incorporate love, as it were, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all in that one area of dhikr? Well, as I said earlier, Allahumma inni ataqarrabu ilayka bi dhikrik. Mm -hmm. We gain nearness to Allah through remembering. And I don't think you can quantify right. or you could subjectively talk about the quality of that dhikr. There's no limit. The Quran says, Allah kathiran. Remember yeah. Allah kathiran. Kathiran, <coughs> kathiran. How much is that? Can you ever reach a level where you've remembered Allah enough and done Allah justice? And the reason you're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it allows your growth as a human being. Yes. You remember the generosity of the Lord, you're generous to other human beings. You remember, uh, you know, the, uh, the mercy of the Lord, you become merciful to others. So therefore, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what helps the growth of the human. And also, we have to, also, we have to realize that we human beings, because when you're talking about challenges yeah. to our spiritual growth, <coughs> I think there are two main challenges to the spiritual growth of the human being. Okay. Ego. Right. And forgetfulness. Now, ego is not a bad thing. You know, you, there needs to be a sense of pride in the human being. Okay. But not a pride which makes you disobey your Lord. Or not a pride which makes you reach a level where you know salah is obligatory on you. You know the Lord deserves more than five minutes of thank you. And you just blatantly go months without praying. Yeah. I come back to my point. In a lot of cases, the spiritual journey is in your hands. We make it complicated. It's not that complicated. If you can kill that ego at that dhuhr prayer moment, or when you've become this really big businessman or woman, and you start telling people, you know, it was me. Yeah, it was all me. At that moment, you're now slowly getting black dots onto that heart of yeah. yours. Yeah. And which sense? In the sense that your ego is now overtaking, Taking. giving everything back to the Lord. A very Qaruni type. You know, Qarun in the Quran, when, when he would show off his wealth and they'd ask him, how'd you get it? It's all from my own self. Nobody else, you know. But God, no, 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 me. So ego, yes. number one. I think number two, forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. That's why dhikr is so important. Sure. Because we, the human being, insan, yinsa, nisyan. We forget. Yeah. El insan, one of the derivatives is they say nisyan. There's this forgetfulness in the human being where we can go a whole day without really saying Alhamdulillah or Subhanallah or Allahu Akbar. And that's why the gift that we got from Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, 34 times Allahu Akbar, 33 times Alhamdulillah, 33 times Subhanallah. 
it was meant to take us out of the lower forgetfulness human wow. to the higher realm human who just doesn't want to forget Allah. To the extent Imam Ali السلام, would say, I don't do anything except that I see Allah before it, during it, after, no, after it. it. Yes. You know, so that's the type of level we want to reach. And those two challenges, ego and forgetfulness, are sometimes the biggest challenges to our spiritual growth. Okay. Um, viewers, just as a reminder, please do call in. The telephone number is 0203 515 Once again, the mediums that you can use to call and communicate your messages or um, questions are WhatsApp, Facebook, and also directly call in. Um, just a few minutes remaining. <coughs> you mentioned, um, Sayyidina, about forgetfulness. And also, you know, some of the pitfalls and challenges that we face today. Um, going now to perhaps the benefits of spirituality. Um, often people talk about, for example, what they can attain, signs, maybe intuition, dreams perhaps. And also, without them even knowing, you know, Allah is remembering them. But what other benefits are they sort of deriving from? Do you need the benefits when you've met Allah? Mm. Do you need the benefits when you've known of Allah? There are people who may want to enter the spiritual path because they're like, well, if I don't become spiritual, I might go to hell. But that's like a business relationship. I'm being spiritual so that you don't put me in hell. Yeah, yeah. And there are people who may become spiritual because they're like, well, if I do these spiritual acts, I might go to heaven. But that's a relationship sometimes. I think the first one about fear, Imam Ali described it as a relationship with someone who's a, like a slave with slave, a master. Yes. And this one with heaven, he said, is the relationship of a business man. Mm -hmm. But you want to go on this spiritual journey because you found God and you want to gain closeness to God because there is nothing but positive vibes in gaining that closeness to God. And I come back to my point. Let's not just talk about Islam. Yeah. Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, um, Sikhism, you know, uh, Judaism, all of them, when you, f you will find that there are special people in their histories who them finding God resulted in them being willing to serve the creation. It built a lovely culture. Yes. You look at, you look at, for example, in Islamic history, those companions of the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, when they found God, they were there to help all of the members of that Medina society. In Jewish culture, in Christian culture, there are personalities who if they saw a Muslim person who was unwell in Andalusia, in Spain, even if he's a Jewish physician, he would go to help that person. Such people, when they found God, they end up help put the building bricks for a better society. And that's why this interfaith dialogue that we see uh -huh. is fundamental because I think the more of us talk about our experiences in having God in our lives and how positive these experiences are, the more great a world is. Now, someone might come and say to me, but Islam and Christianity and all of these faiths have really bad moments as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Therefore, why are you telling me about a God when your religions have got some really bad... Yet yeah, my religion's bad examples don't mean there's no God. No. It just means we had some rubbish in our religion. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't mean there's no God. Why do we always look at the bad apples? Sure. You know? Yes. If you're looking at these religions, you'll find that there were personalities in these religions. If a sick person is on the street, they didn't care about asking for the identity of that person. They saw God within that person and they said, that's a child of God on the street. They moved from I to we, from individual to duteous, 
And that's where the spiritual growth takes the human being. I just fear for the world that we're living in, yeah. that in the name of individual rights, which has its place, okay. we're now moving to a direction where anyone who questions the definition of individual rights is cornered. My questioning of the definition of individual rights is does that entail a duty within an ethical paradigm and that ethical paradigm is a paradigm revealed to us <coughs> through God and his messengers. Yes. Abraham, Christ, Muhammad, peace be upon his family. You're looking at these personalities. Don't just look at them literally in terms of what they did. Try and scratch the surface or go to the layers below what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You were just in Hajj, yes. Abraham, sacrifice, Ishmael. Most Muslims only look at it up to that level. Yeah. They don't look at the altruism that emerges. They don't look at the willingness to be forbearant for the sake of the Lord, to give back towards the Lord. Christ washing the feet of his disciples, Christ with the poor. Christ with the leper. Don't just look at the surface of that. No. Go to the deeper levels and see that Christ didn't ask what religion that leper was or that Christ didn't say that that leper, do you believe in me as the savior, as your guide? If you don't, I'm not going to help you, mm -hmm. but rather I don't care, I'll help you okay, because everyone yes. else has forgotten you or neglected you yes. and likewise we can do the same. And when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, speaks out for the right of that baby girl being buried alive, mm -hmm. don't just look at the literal surface meaning, but rather speak out, rather look at the fact that he's possibly saying to you, don't you also become one who oppresses the woman folk in your society by beating your wife or hitting your sister or being rude to someone of the opposite gender? Sure, sure. Yes. Those are the benefits, in my opinion, in a religious culture that allows you to find God into your life. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, so now we just have two minutes, I think, left. So what I'd like to do is just fast forward to Karbala, we're um, slowly approaching uh, Muharram soon, inshallah. Um, and also I'd like to point out to the attention of viewers that um, 18th or 19th of Hajj, 1802, Karbala was ransacked by the Wahhabis. Just very briefly say now, what lessons can we learn from, from that? Because it was a brutal period, yeah. 12,000 Wahhabis, um, ransacked the, shrine, the Holy Shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. 4,000 camels were used to take away artifacts as spoils of um, jewels and uh, wealth, as it were. Um, and it was actually carried out on Eid, Eid al-Ghadir, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So uh, just very, very quickly, if you can possibly just, just remind viewers, I, I don't think most viewers really know about this occurrence, just what really happened? Yes, it was It was right at the beginning of the 19th century. Mm. And, you know, up to 5,000 of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt were massacred by the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. You know, they can try their hardest to wipe off the love of Hussein alayhi salam, but they'll never succeed. No, no. And it's an honor to have known that there were people who gave their lives away to protect that grave of the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Okay. And I think the whole world is now beginning to realize the hatred and the arrogance that <coughs> Wahhabism entails. Okay. And uh, I hope all Muslims, all lovers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, never forget that Holocaust that took place. Okay. Um, 
we have just enough time for two very quick WhatsApp questions. Um, yeah. Is it okay to marry a Sunni willing to convert? First question. Second question. If I, w if I want to ask a woman in hand in marriage, but the father keeps rejecting while the woman herself wants to agree to the marriage, what is one's rights in this situation? You know, and then we'll have to end immediately after those two answers, inshallah. In terms of marrying uh, someone from another madhab, you know, there is, there, there's no harm technically, legally, mm -hmm. in marrying someone else who's a believer in La ilaha illallah, Muhammad and Rasulullah. Sure. But you've got to be practical in your, you know, uh, in your reality of the situation and your understanding of it. What do you both believe in? Who do you ad admire? Yeah, absolutely. Who do you differ on? Yeah, you got to be practical. Are What's you gonna, the focus? Where, where are you heading? Mm. You know, and these things have to be discussed way before the marriage is done. Okay. In terms of the second, second one, question, someone proposes for a girl, but her father rejects. Father's rejection, yes. So, you know, if, if the father rejects at that moment, then one of the things to do is maybe speak to a figure who's close with the father, right. a revered religious sure. figure, a revered family member, you know, maybe have a word with them okay. and let them speak to the father. There's no need to keep on insisting or to become, you know, there are many guys these days who are, just, you know, tear up when, <laughs> when, when the father's saying no, you know, I think just be a bit stronger. Yeah. And if you too, it's meant to be, then you just have to have patience. Nothing needs to be rushed um, and show respect and um, humility in these periods. Okay. Yeah. From Sayyidina Muharram, Dr. Muharram. Manakshwani and from myself, Muhammad Ali, Assalamu Alaikum and see you again inshallah next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah.